Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of My Sunderland 11, as always, in association with the Sunderland Food Bank. As you can see, the top right corner of your screen, and also the top left is the Sunderland Fans Museum. Um, go and check them out. They've been doing great work during lockdown, and as we are now coming to the end of it, those are people that have really helped uh, the people that have uh, been in need throughout uh, this this tough year, really. So go and check them out and uh, do what you can to um, support. Today's guest, I think... <laughs> How, how could I introduce Mickey? I mean, it's the person me and my dad have relied on for away tickets for how long would you say? Oh, that. <laughs> yeah, 10 years probably. <laughs> probably, probably, some, probably something like that. But yeah, uh, big son of fan, Mickey Coombs, how are you? How are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Yeah, despite everything. <laughs> oh, Sunderland is doing all right at the moment on a good run. Well, well Sunderland is doing okay. And it's the. It's the silver cloud, if you like, to this very bad lockdown. The silver lining to this very bad lockdown cloud, because it, the, 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 the increase in fortunes has almost coincided exactly with this, with this lockdown. So, yeah, absolutely. Going. Yeah, absolutely. Have you found watching this season though? It's been different to obviously other seasons. Well, it's it's a, it's a lot different because I don't usually watch um, matches on the television. Um, and I haven't missed one this season, home or away. So I, I usually get to a few home matches and and quite a lot of away matches, as you know. Um, and I haven't, I haven't missed going to the matches, to be honest. Um, but I have missed the crack in the pub before and after our away games. Because, um, you know, we tend to get there earlier and earlier to have a bit of a, a nap and a few drinks. And um, yeah, we've had to do that on WhatsApp and it's not the same. No. I know, absolutely. The WhatsApp group goes, uh, it goes, it goes mental. It's just usually my dad complaining about Lee Burge or Jack Diamond or or, or anyone really. I think, um, yeah, the WhatsApp group's always been there, but I don't think it's ever been more active um, <laughs> now than it's ever been really. It hasn't, and I and I just wonder sometimes whether your dad actually believes what he says or whether he just sort of likes the blue touch paper and retires and waits for everyone <laughs> to, to dive in. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure. I think, but I think the last time we were all um, at a pub, you know, the normal, the normal match day thing. I think it might have been Portsmouth back in um, February of 2020. Um, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure it. I'm pretty sure it was. And um, yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of um, how long it was. Obviously, the season ended um, probably the worst possible way with us finishing yeah. outside the playoffs. But I mean, this season it's the third season in League One. Have you have you sort of found found this season? It's been a strange season because um, Parkinson was manager at the start of it, and he's got a good record as a manager, so I didn't have any particular problems with him. But you know, it, it all seems strange to leave McGeady out of the starting lineup and to humiliate him really by making him train with the kids. And um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in believing in the manager, so I just thought that there must have been something dramatic happened behind the scenes for that to happen. But it meant he couldn't put out his best team and we were we were really in a rut. And Johnson's come in and to be honest, you know, if he hadn't done anything else but put McGeady in the team, we would have had a lot more success because he's had something like six goals, 14 assists. He's he's turned Wyke from a, a very, very average centre forward into a into a goal scoring supremo. And that's in McGeady, I think, who's who's done that as much as anything yeah. else. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously the new owners have come in as well. What's sort of been your first opinion on um on them? Well, he's he's about the same age as the youngest of my five children. He's he's not much older than you, Matthew. Um, <laughs> and, he, and, and he looks it. Yeah. And, um, but I'll tell you what, all new owners say the say the right things when they first come in. But yeah. I'm a great, I'm a great believer. I, I lap it all up. I believe everything they say. I'm massively um, optimistic now. He's talked about a 16 million, a 16 million war chest over the next few years. Well, we won't need that much for now, I don't think. But it's going to be very, very crucial. If I mean, the key thing is to get up this season. And but if we can, the buying. Yeah, because he's not going to renew anybody's contracts. I think has he got eighteen players or twenty players out of contract? It's something like that. I only think there's a, only a handful that are, are still in contract for next season. 
and he's not going to renew anybody's contract till he knows where we are. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are you confident now we're going to go up this season? I'm, I'm, yes, I'm starting to feel more. I'm starting to feel more confident now. I think I still don't think we're playing very well. But there again, I don't think anybody else is playing very well. I think it's a, I think it's the nature of this division that it's not a particularly good footballing division. And I think we've all set our sights quite high. And I think that's why quite a few of us are disappointed with the performances. But it's just game by game, isn't it? Let's just get there. I just do not want to be in the playoffs again. I don't want to go to Wembley again. Yeah. But yeah, I do. No, I, yeah. I just want to win. We just want to win. Um, although we have done that, but none of us, none of us. Are, I mean, of course, I've got to mention it. Really, the Wembley, the Wembley game. It was great to win and to see, you know, see that actually our team. It was weird for me because I'm not used to seeing Sunderland be the team that are lifting a trophy and spraying champagne everywhere. You know, it no. was weird, and, and to not be there was awful. Well, I, I mean, I was there in 1973, and I've been there nine times since, and we haven't won. So, no, eight times since. So I've been nine times altogether. One win mm. and then eight defeats. And now a win, which I wasn't at. Which, um, but I'd, I'd rather them win and me not be there than us lose. Yeah. So. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, but I, I mean, I'm hopefully we're there in a in an FA Cup final or a League Cup final or a Champions League final. Hopefully it's never going to be a playoff for Papa John's trophy ever again, though. Um but anyway, we'll, <laughs> we'll, yeah, uh, but yeah. I should also mention the other bad thing about this lockdown has been lack of hairdressers. So this is yeah. my tribute to Frank Worthington, a great Sunderland player who died a couple of weeks ago, who had hair a little bit like me. He thought he was a bit of a rock star, and I don't. <laughs> but that's why I look like this. <laughs> I know it's very soon though it's very soon the barbers are going to open 12th of right. April I've got yeah. mine booked in for the 14th uh, I, haven't had, I haven't had a haircut since December so I'm looking forward to it I'm looking no forward me. to it no me <laughs> um, alright then well, uh, just uh, leads me on to sort of my next question really um, so we're sort of steering away from the, the current sort of things that are going on just a question for you Mickey how long have you actually been supporting Sunderland well I first went to Roper Park with my dad and my uncle in 1956, which is 65 years ago. So I was six years old. So that was probably about the same time as, as you started. Um, yeah. And at that time, we'd never been out the, the top division since we were elected in 1890. So we took 68 years on broken membership. And it was the longest unbroken membership of any team. I think, I think Arsenal's gone past it now, but... It's still the second longest unbroken membership. So we only lived 100 yards from the, the ground. So we used to go along and um, we used to stand in the um, Roker range about two thirds of the way back, just to the left of the goal. When I say stand, my dad used to prop me on this um, stone barrier, a crash barrier, a crush barrier, I think. And um, whenever Sunderland scored, he used to leap about like a madman and I just used to hang on for dear life on this stone barrier. And um, several occasions I got knocked off and had to, you know, 67 year old, had to claw my way back up to a standing position. Yeah. And, and it got to be that I actually dreaded Sunderland scoring because I was so scared when everybody was leaping about. But that's, that's, that's how long I've been um, supporting them, a long time. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, you see, when you were six, it was the exact same for me when I was six. In fact, the shirt you're wearing uh, was the first season that I, I think I started supporting. That's when I was six years old when we had that shirt. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, I don't know why. I think that's the age. I think you start to understand everything a little bit more. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, it was the exact same for me, really. But do you remember the first ever game that you actually went to? I don't. I, I really don't. But I remember certain things about football matches back then. And I remember my dad saying to me, look at that guy there. That's Len Shackleton. He's one of the greatest players who's ever lived. Look at that guy there. Look at that guy. So I remember seeing Len Shackleton play, but I couldn't say to you, oh, I remember when he did this or that or the other. The yeah. first match, I can really, really remember. I was probably about 10, and it was an FA Cup tie against Arsenal. Third round. We'd been relegated by then, and they were first division. 
And the, and on the Friday, the day before the match, my dad was having lunch at the Seabird Hotel, which became the Marriott, and I think it was now the Grand, above the seafront. Yeah. There. And all the Arsenal team was staying there, and he got all their autographs from me on the lunch menu. So, um, so that was a big thing for me. Um, and then the next day, uh, he took me to watch the game, and we and we won the game. So, second division beat the first division, and um, Stan Anderson scored two goals. And he didn't score many goals. So that was a, a standout game. And that's the first game I can really remember being there. And I think it was probably because he'd um, got all the autographs the day before, which is quite exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, but do you ever, would you say you have a, a, the best, what's the best memory you think that sticks out for you? Oh, it has to be the 1973 Cup final. I mean, anybody of my age and, and, and a bit younger probably, because um, we'd, we'd won the Cup in 1937, but we'd won precious little since. So to get to the Cup final in the first place, as a second division team and a lowly second division team, playing against the best team in Europe by a country mile was fantastic. And then to beat them, you know, 100,000 fans. I would have thought 60 to 70 percent were, were Sunderland fans. You know, you know what it's like when yeah. Sunderland fans just beg, steal or borrow um, tickets and the, and the absolute high spot of, of probably my life to date was the 32nd minute. So 3.32, May the 5th, 1973, when Porterfield swung his wrong leg at that ball and crashed it in. I was standing at that end about halfway back and that was just, just like madness. It was one pound for a ticket to stand and um, we were in the pub beforehand and one of my mates had come down. He didn't have a ticket but he was just want to see, you know, have the atmosphere. And this Leeds fan came up to us and he says, hey lads, have you all got tickets? And we said, no, one of us hasn't. He says, here, have a ticket for a fiver. Uh, five times face value. And my mate said, oh no, that's too much. And I said, Derek, man. So I've got a fiver out of my pocket. I put it in his hand. There's a lot of money in those days. And then um, grab the ticket, give it to Derek. And he said, there you are, mate, you owe me a fiver. And he was in the league <laughs> deck. But when the, when the teams came out, all you could see on the other end was red and white as well. So, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's incredible. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the fans of they do that wherever they go. I mean, even in the um, eighty-five Milk Cup final, I think we took about what sixty thousand fans that day as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it it just it just show, it just shows really like it, in in any game I, I think you know we could we could sell out we could sell out a game anywhere and I think that's you know it's always been it's, it's always been like that with the Sunderland fans, um yeah. but yeah I, I've got one sort of one last question for you though before we do go through um your team um and that's what does Sunderland AFC mean to you? Oh, blimey. it's it's almost like a religion, isn't it? It's. Yeah. Um, I remember once, years ago, on a Saturday morning, getting out of bed and sitting on the side of the bed and saying, oh, I've got to go to the bloody match today. And my wife's saying, well, you haven't got to. I said, I do. I do have to, you know. And it was, and it's a bit like that, you know. It's almost yeah. really what's going on. You've just got to go yeah. and watch them. And, um, I mean, even in your relatively short time supporting them, it's been it's mainly down the bottom, but it's very up and down, isn't it? And it's been like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, the third year that I've supported them, they got relegated for the first time, and they've been yo-yoing ever since. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I think, as you say, it is sort of like um, a, a religion, really. I think it's sort of like the main thing that, that you you look forward to to doing it. It's you know you always look forward. You know after you you know you've been to a match and you get home, it's always you know, what's the next match I'm going to go to. Or when the fixtures first come out, you're always going to go. You know you look at a place and go, oh that would be a good away day. I'll look for pubs there and, and whatever. That it's what it's all about, really, isn't it? Yeah, and and it's 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 strange because when I'm watching the games on the telly, I'm getting really nervous because I don't know why, but I don't have a drink when I'm watching the games at home. Um, when you go away from home, you have two or three pints beforehand, and then all the nerves seem to go. In fact, you know, yeah. you have two or three pints, and you think, oh, I'd much rather stay and have a few more pints than go to the match. But we never do. We always go to the match. 
Yeah, sometimes ro rolling in a little bit late as well. I think it was at Oxford, Oxford away where you came in and we were, we were one nil up. Didn't you say you were walking to the grounds and you saw the Sunderland fans jump up? Because obviously oh, yeah. the fence. <laughs> yes, that was that was that that that, that last season was, that was two or three years ago. Yeah, that, that was last night. That was last season. Because when you walk across the car park, there's no end to that. Yeah. Ground. So you can see right into the ground, and you can see right into the Sunderland fans, and that's that's a really dreadful feeling <laughs> when you're running across the car park and you say, "Oh, the fans go up." And it was one nil, I think, wasn't it? In the final score. Yeah. Yeah, it was one nil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, an interesting day. It was, it was a, it was a great away day. Like it was in the storm as well. Um, but, but yeah. Um, anyway, we'll go through. Uh, we'll go through your team then, um, yeah. which is what what we're all here to do. Um, right. So let's let's start off with, with who you having go go. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you how difficult this was, and you, you know your memory fades with age anyway. And when you've been supporting for 65 years, you've got many more players to choose from. And I'm I'm dreading missing out the favourite player. But also, I didn't watch any of your previous uh, YouTube's because I didn't want to be influenced. Yeah. So I've got a lot. I've got a lot to catch up on. But when I first started watching football, until I was in my mid-teens, until I was about your age, I guess, teams lined up: two at the back, three in the middle, and five at the front. So that's how I still sort of see, see teams. But I've tried to pick a team in a more modern 4-4-2 formation. And I've tried to pick a team that works, that would... Yeah. Yeah? Yep. So, okay. So do you want to start with the keeper? Yeah, talk us through who you've got in goal first, yeah. Well, I mean, we've had some pretty good goalies over the years. You know, right up to Lee Burge at the moment. <laughs> and yeah. for anybody watching who doesn't know Matthew's dad he's got an obsessive hatred about, about, <laughs> about, about um, yeah. the, the first goalkeeper I remember was a guy called Willie Watson back in the 50s and he was a bit of a daredevil and he wore a red goalie's jersey which was very unusual because all goalkeepers wore green and he wore red um, another guy from uh, the 60s was a, a goalie called Sonny McLaughlin. He was a good-looking lad, and he used to drop the drop kick the ball out of his hands, and it went miles, quite often to the other keeper. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've had some really good keepers over the years, you know, Tommy Sorensen, Craig Gordon, Jordan Pickford. But I just can't go past Jimmy Montgomery um, for yeah. my keeper. He's a local boy from Hendon. He's got the record number of appearances for a Sunderland player. And he made that wonder double save in the 1973 Cup final. And it was no coincidence that, you know the statue of Bob Stoko outside the ground, and he's running across the pitch with his arms out, and he was running towards Jimmy Montgomery because he knew that Jimmy had won the Cup for us. Um, and I met, I met Jimmy a few times, and... I've asked him before, you know, did you save that or did it hit you? And he, he, he said to me, he said, he saw Trevor Cherry coming in for the first shot and he saved it. And it was a pretty good save. And he hit the ground. And as his head was coming up like this, he just saw the ball bouncing kindly to Peter Lama, the guy who had the fastest shot in football. And he thought, shit. Yeah, and he's still on the ground. Yeah. And Norman's got his foot back to wallop this ball in the empty net, really. And he said he flung himself in the direction of this blur and pushed his arm up like that. And it hit his arm up onto the up onto the bar. He said, So what I did was intentional. And therefore it was a save. And I and I I've watched it since many times actually. And if you watch it, he does. Going for the second save, he pushes his arm up in the direction of the ball. And um, and and he actually made a better save than that in an away game, which my brother was at. And my brother and I were talking to Jimmy, and uh, my brother mentioned this, and Jimmy said, yeah, that was a better save. Unfortunately, there's no cameras there. But anyway, yeah. local boy, local hero, he's still a... Um, Whenever you go into hospitality, you see him in there talking to all the fans. He loves it. 
Yeah. Great, great yeah. representative. Yeah, yeah, he is definitely. He, he is, he is one hundred percent. And even you know, younger supporters like myself, you know, I think that everyone's done a good job of keeping that, sort of that legacy going and alive. Everyone, you know, even supporters maybe, I don't know, maybe ten or eleven years old, you know, just someone who just started starting supporting the club. I think they all have heard of Jimmy Montgomery and they've all seen that save. I think it is because it is so famous. And with that statue being outside the stadium, yeah. um, I do think people will uh, will remember that forever really but yeah you you've got to put you definitely got to put jimmy montgomery in your team there if you do remember the the 73 final so we'll head now to we'll stop so it's a 4-4-2 formation you try to put these players in so yes. we'll go to your right back right back it's always been a bit of a problem position for Sunderland, but it's produced some real characters over the years and um, Back in the 60s, we had a guy called Cecil Irwin. In the 70s, we had Dick Malone. In the 80s, we had John Kay. And they were all pretty well the same. They all loved to get forward. And all of them, as soon as they got over the halfway line, the crowd started shouting, shoot, shoot. Yeah? Yeah. Which, and, which was great, except on the telly, it sounded like the crowd were booing. You know, shoot. Yeah. And, and people have said to me, why, why do all your fans boo the right back all the time? I said, no, they're not saying, they're not booing and they're shouting shoot. But we've had a couple of half decent full backs, Chris Makin, Phil Barsley, who's still playing in the Premier League for Burnley. But I'm going to go for Barry Venison. He's another yep. local boy. He was great going forward. And he went on to play for Liverpool and he played a couple of caps, got a couple of caps for England, and I just liked his enthusiasm, all the time enthusiastic and always willing to try and push forward. So that's my right back. Yeah, no, fair enough. I, I, I think um, I, did, I did an episode with Chris Turner and Chris Turner put him in, um, put him in his team as well. I think, yeah, he was, he was uh, yeah, fantastic. Fantastic right back you got there. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, switch, we'll switch sides and go to your, to your left back. So who have you got a left back? And we've had some pretty good left backs over the years. And then our first was a, a full back in the 60s. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him in some of your teams. Hard as nails. He, I think he's the record appearance holder for an outfield player. Yeah. Or something. Liverpool boy. The, the, the biggest thing I can say about Len is that George Best never got the better of him. And that's saying something because he's one of the greatest footballers who's ever lived. And Lenny used to put him into the clock stand almost every time we played against him. Um, we've had some other good ones. Joe Bolton, another local lad, hard as nails. George McCartney, very elegant player. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed going forward every chance. Julio Arca, great crowd favourite in the early 2000s. Also played left midfield. Um, he only retired recently. And um, I went down to see him play for South Shields in the FA Vars final in 2016, which they won 4 nothing. Yeah. But I'm not going for any of those. I'm going for Michael Gray. He's yeah. Another local boy. You're going to think I've chosen all local boys, but I haven't. <laughs> uh, but um, this coincides with the lowest point in my footballing supporting career. And possibly the lowest point in my whole life, and that was the playoff final against Charlton in 1998. Mm. And Michael Gray missed the crucial penalty. Um, however, he's a smashing lad. He's got bags of energy. He's a very skillful lad. He went on to play three times for England, and he is my left back. So we've got three local boys so far. Yeah, three. Um so I don't. Know, I think I think we've got a few a few to come as well. But yeah, of course, I think you got to put M Michael Gray in your team. A lot of people have actually because he he was that he was really good. I mean, you, you remember like the cross he gave for Noah Quinn against um you know against Newcastle. You know, one two one um like just 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 things like that. I think quality that um sort of doesn't come around very often. But when you have something like that in your team, and especially the fact that he was actually a Sunderland fan as well. I mean, I think he was just the perfect player for us, really. It still is. Yeah, it still is. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. He he still is, and he keeps himself still very fit now. You always see him on his Instagram doing like workout videos and whatever. Um, but uh, he, he he could probably still do a job now. I think I I might have him over McFadzine. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, oh, it's it. <laughs> yeah, it's it. touch and go. I think we've seen the I think we've seen the last of McFadzine. <laughs> Yeah, you know, we've got uh, we've, we've got Denver Hume back, who I don't think actually is a much better defender than Matt Fazing, but he's a much better footballer. Yeah, and we've got yeah. this Vulcan's guy from Southampton who um, is starting to look quite good. So I think it's bye bye Matt Fazing, and he's not as yeah. good as my career now. No, <laughs> absolutely not. No. Um... But anyway, we'll, we'll head now to your um, your central defenders. You can talk us through um, each one of them. Okay, now, as I said earlier, up to my mid-teens, um, teams only had one centre-half, um, with a right half to his right and a left half to his left. So it's a bit of a luxury for me being able to pick two centre-halves. Um, but the Sunderland player of the last century, voted for by the fans, was Charlie Hurley. Yes, and I yeah. can't argue with that. I was fortunate enough to see his whole Sunderland career from when he arrived as a 21-year-old and that was the first year we got relegated. So it was a really, really bad start for him, you know. And um, I think the very first game he played, we got beat six or seven, nothing. So it was a, it was a pretty poor start. But he, he played over 400 games for over a dozen years. And he was a truly magnificent player. Um, he was a fantastic tackler. His timing was immaculate. I just can't remember anybody ever getting past him. He was brilliant in the air, both in defence and in attack. And whenever we got a corner, the, ch the, the, the chant went up, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. And as he started moving forward, the roar got louder and louder and louder. And he used to line up just outside the corner of the penalty area, opposite to where the corner was being taken. And he would start running in. And the corner taker would try and put the ball onto the penalty spot and he would just launch himself into the air. And if he could get his head on it, you know, you had a very good chance of that ball getting in the net. And the, we, we got quite a few goals from rebounds, from, you know, goalkeeper saves and what have you. He was, he, he was a fantastic player. Played many, many times for the Republic of Ireland. And um, he's quite rightly, I think, the fans player of the century. And then, and he goes into my team without any shadow of a doubt. Yeah, absolutely. I think he um, wait, he, he signed he signed from Millwall, <clears throat> didn't he? And he, I think he spent did, 12, yeah. 12 years at Sunderland, um, which was which is pretty really. I think he said in his interviews, he goes, "I have no idea how I, I went all the way from Millwall all the way up to Sunderland." He says he's got no idea how that happened, but he says it was the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. Oh, he still looked in Sunderland, and then. Um, I met him once and I talked about a particular goal he scored. And I think it might have been in that little cup run we had when we beat Arsenal in the third round and we beat Norwich one nothing away from home. And I used to have a picture of it on my bedroom wall because he's, he scored the, the only goal and his head is above the level of the bar. And he's just, he's like that. And he's just thundering this ball. And, and he says, I remember that goal. He says, that was some goal. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, but yeah, this is looking a very, very strong defence so far. So do you want to tell us who the next centre-back is that will finish off the back four? Well, it gets even stronger. I mean, we've had some other great and some really charismatic centre-backs. Centre Martin Harvey, Jeff Clark, Teddy Butcher, John O'Shea. But I'm going to go for Dave Watson. Um, he was bought by Alan Brown as a centre-forward centre and played there for couple of seasons, I think, and he was converted by Bob Stoke onto a centre half and he became a an England centre half. I, I don't know how many times he played for England, sixty, something like that. And he was a commanding centre half. He was he was great in the air and hard as nails. And of course cup final centre half and nobody got past him. The other reason it's good to have somebody like him in the side is that if you're desperate for a goal, you can always push him up front. And he used to really, really crush around the opposition defences and create mayhem. But he was a wonderful centre-half. And um, the Charlie Hurley and Dave Watson in the centre at the back, I can't imagine, was ever conceding a goal, especially with Jimmy Diaz. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it looks. I mean, you, you know, your 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 back four of uh, Barry Venice and Charlie Hurley, Dave Watson, and Michael Gray. <clears throat> I mean, that's both sort of brilliant attacking. Obviously, you've got Michael Gray who can you know run up and down the wings, put the crosses in, um, have some shots. Charlie Hurley, Dave Watson, as you said, they can go up for corners, score yeah. um, great goals, and obviously, yeah, you've got, of course, you got Jimmy Montgomery who who'll make the save. So I think you know for that being your defence. Honestly, that's. Uh, I reckon those five players there could just take on a, an eleven a side team. Really, They're just them yeah. them doing a five, yeah. five a side team. <clears throat> All right, then. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Then that's your defence. So we'll head we'll head to your midfield. So I think we could start with who you have on the left wing first. On the left, right. So on the left, we've had some we've had some great players in this position. Back to the sixties, George Mulhall was a, a Scottish left winger. We had. Great left winger. Um, and Billy Hughes, of course, in the 60s and the 70s. Alan Johnson was a great left winger, playing opposite Mickey Somerby when Quinney and Phillips were in the centre. And uh, that was a great forward threat. But I'm going to go for Dennis Stewart, despite the fact he was born in Newcastle. <laughs> and he played for us in the 60s and 70s. And he was a brilliant attacking left winger. Great crosser of the ball, ran direct up the defence, and caused absolute mayhem. He went on, of course, to play for uh, Man City and England, and he holds a special place in, in the hearts of Sunderland supporters because he scored a spectacular overhead kick in the League Cup final against Newcastle in 1976. Yeah, and that, yeah, absolutely. A few people have put him in um, in their team as well, and I think, yeah, you know, as you as you just make there the, the points. I mean, he was. Clearly, you know, scoring against scoring a goal against Newcastle, even if it comes off your let, even if it comes off your backside. But I mean, to score an overhead kick, uh, that's unbelievable. It really is. It was a, it was, it was certainly one of the most spectacular goals you'll ever see at Wembley. Yeah, yeah, no, that's 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 brilliant. So, um, all right, then. So that's who you have. That's who you have on the um on the on the left wing. Um, we'll head now to who you've got on the um who you got on the right. Right, well, again, strong candidates. Um, we've got people like Martin Harvey and Stan Anderson who were right halves and internationals back in the 50s and the 60s. We've got people like Billy Bingham from the 50s and Nicky Summerby in the late 90s and early 2000s who were both traditional right wingers. I was pretty close to selecting Nicky Summerby because I did like him. He was a good, aggressive winger and... Um, and used to get the ball over, and he could also move across to the left-hand side. Um, but I've come down on the side of the little general, Bobby Kerr. Yeah. Um, very brave. He came back from two broken legs, absolute workhorse, up and down the wing, great cross of the ball. Sometimes it looked as if he was going to swing himself off his feet, um, crossing the ball. Inspirational captain, 1973 captain, of course. And um, it was a close run thing on the right side of midfield. But um, you, you just felt that if he was on form, the rest of the team played well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I mean, just be a football aside, I mean, I think. I think someone coming from Scotland, um, you know, to, you know, to play for a team, you know, you, you know, you're not from that area, but I mean, it just shows he he still lives in Sunderland now, and um, you know, I think it's a you know an amb ambassador of the club now, um, someone who I think works closely with the fans museum as well. So you just, it's great to have those players who are class on and off the pitch as well. Yes, he's a he's a he's a he's a great little lad, and he and he loves the attention he gets. Whenever he goes to the match, I think, I think he goes to all the match, and I think he, like Jimmy, I think he's one of the hospitality hosts. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he he is. I've I have seen him around a few times as well. But it's great to see players like that, you know, who who've played for the club so long ago. And I mean, you know, they could have they could have you know they've retired and they could have gone anywhere. But the fact that they've actually wanted to stay at the club, it just shows how you know not only they were special to the supporters, but also the supporters are very special to them. Um, at the same time as well, which is which is great to see. Um, yeah. All right, then. So those those are your two your two wingers. We'll go now to your central midfield. So do you want to talk us through who you've got there? 
Well, um, I had a few on my list here. Paul Bracewell and Tony Towers are both great central midfielders. But I'm going to go with Colin Todd. Um, he's another local boy. I think he's probably the most talented footballer ever to be produced by um, in the Sunderland area. Very, very elegant, skillful guy, but hard as nails. He was just as good at preventing the opposition getting an attack going as he was at starting off an attack of ours. Um, he was a brilliant, brilliant footballer. And he went on to win two first division titles with Derby County under um, under Brian Clough. Um, but he, he he's a very very strong strong centre midfield. I mean, in his time he played right half, but um, he, he 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 would grace any football field. Yeah, yeah, abs- absolutely. Um, uh, that's what other few people have said as well. Who, who've chosen, who have chosen Colin Todd. I think some people like that. You know, they can't go unnoticed in in these sort of teams. Um, but his midfield partner, who will be playing alongside him? Well, I toyed with a few people. I tried to match who would play well along Colin, alongside Colin Todd. I, did, I thought about Kevin Ball because he was, uh, you know, they shall not pass type of midfield player. But but yeah. Colin- Colin Todd was a bit like that as well. He could be very, very hard. I even thought about Jordan Henderson because, you know, the um, you know, for his box-to-box abilities. But I've gone for... If somebody asked you the question, who was your favourite Sunderland player ever? This guy would be right up there for me. Uh, Jim Baxter. Yeah. He's probably the most naturally talented Footballer I saw play for Sunderland, nicknamed Slim Jim. Um, unfortunately, it, it was too good for us at the time. He he had been an outstanding star for Glasgow Rangers in Scotland. Um, he used to he he used to play through balls through, and our players would look at him as if to say, "What are you kicking the ball there for?" And you could, you, as a fan, you could see that he was expecting them to anticipate the ball and run onto it, you know? And they just yeah. stand there, you know, too thick to understand that it was going to put this great through ball through. He had a he had a real couldn't care less attitude, which was quite endearing to a teenager like me. And well Sunderland used to run out at Roker Park to the theme tune of a um, of a police series called Z Cars. And yeah. when when the first few bars struck up, the, t- the crowd knew that the thing were were going to run out, and um, and they started roaring. And Charlie Hurley would run out with a ball under his arm like this, and then the rest of the team would run out. And fully ten seconds later, Baxter would walk out with his hands down his shorts and just wander up to the centre circle. <laughs> Everybody else is kicking the ball about, and he's just standing there with his hands down his shorts. <laughs> and uh, if, if anybody kicked the ball to him, he'd kick it back. But he was an outstanding footballer. He played, he played three times, to my knowledge, against England, twice for Scotland and once for the rest of the world. And the, the world then saw just what a genius he was. In one of the games, um, I think Scotland beat us 2 nothing or 2-1. He scored both the goals. And then... Um, this, the Scottish press apparently were very, very annoyed with him because they thought Scotland could have scored a few more, but Baxter was too intent on playing keep the uppies and things like that in the centre circle. You know, playing yeah. playing at Wembley, playing at Wembley against England, he's doing keep the uppies. But he was he was a, he was a great footballer, and he's one of these players where I would have put him in first and tried to build the team around it, around him. And if it mm. and if it didn't work, it didn't matter because he was going to be in my team. End of. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's that's completely fair enough. I think also as well, um, it was back in nineteen sixty five with Sunderland. I think it was a it was a record transfer fee. I don't think I, uh, uh, it was the highest fee highest fee paid for uh, to a Scottish club. Um, for, for a player, I think that was the first sort of record that was set. I believe it was sort of seventy seventy or thousand um, for him. But I mean, it was just it was just all all worth it, really. I mean, I think only played uh, 80, 87 times. So I mean, it just shows what he did in that time, though. I think I, th- I think he had a broken leg when we bought him, and and I don't think he was the same player again after his after his broken leg. But um, anyway, 
Stan yeah. Jay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But that, that's your so that's your that's your midfield though. Um, so I, I, as you saw, spoke with the defence earlier. That's very strong. Midfield is very very strong. Um, now we're going to get onto what's considered to be one of the most important parts of the team, and that's who you're going to rely on to score um, pretty much most of the goals. So do you want to talk us through who you've got um, up front? Well, I mentioned a while ago that um, Len Shackleton was the first superstar that I watched playing for Sunderland, but I only know because my dad told me that, whispering in my ear. But I can't really remember. Um, he he was a, a huge character by all accounts. Um, he, he said he was not biased against Newcastle. And this was the team he used to play for before us. He says he didn't care who beat them. Yeah. And um, he, in his autobiography, he had a chapter entitled what the average football club chairman knows about football, and it was a blank page. <laughs> yeah. But, so his nickname was the Clown Prince of Soccer, and he was also a brilliant, brilliant cricketer. Probably could have played cricket for England as well. But um, as with all um, mavericks and magical footballers, didn't play for England anywhere near as many times as he should have. Um, in the 60s, we had a great centre forward who nobody ever really talked about. He's called Ian Lawler. He scored, I've just looked at his record, and he scored 41 goals in 71 appearances, which is a pretty good return for a team that was sort of um, struggling in the second division at the time. And there was another particular favourite of mine around about the same time called Johnny Crossan, who was a very, very skillful inside left he was at the time. And then we've had Pop Robson and Gary Rowell, and we've had Ali McCoyst, and then more recently we've had Darren Bent and Jermaine Defoe, and all of them could easily have um, got into this team. But my first choice is the greatest goal scorer who I have seen ever, and that's Brian Clough. He scored yeah. 251 goals in 274 appearances, almost a, almost, um, a goal a game. Unfortunately, only 51 of those, 54 of those in 61 appearances were for us before his career was um, cut short um, by a nasty knee injury. And if he hadn't had his career cut short, he possibly wouldn't have made such a great manager. But he was the most selfish player I've ever seen. And he never wanted to give the ball away. He would rather have a shot from the narrowest of angles than cross it to two and marked. Um, colleagues in the six yard area but because he scored nearly every time there's not much you could say about it but he, he, yeah. was, a, he was a wonderful wonderful goal scorer and um, you know he loved nothing better than just to run onto the ball and smash it into the net good scoring goals just what you want yeah of course it is yeah and I think he says as well you know throughout the whole time of his football career playing and managing the time at Sunderland that he had was the best of his career. And uh, yeah, it's, it, that, it, that's great to hear. Shame we never had him as manager, though. That would have been that would have been uh, <laughs> some time. Well, they reckon that he turned us down twice and we turned him down twice. It just never was right for both sides at the same time. But I, I know they did talk about it. And um, of course, his son, Nigel, was born in Sunderland while he was there. So he's, yeah. uh, he, he could have been in my team as a local boy. <coughs> yeah, if you've been, been any good, yeah, oh, yeah, ab ab absolutely. But, um, but yeah, he, he, he stood brilliant at Sunderland, and uh, that's what we'll uh, remember him for. So, he's going to be um, your first striker now. Your second striker, who you could also rely on to score, I think you can yeah. rely on these two to be honest to score the goals. Talk us through who you've gone with. Well, with Brian Clough, there, you don't need anybody else alongside because nobody else is going to get the ball anyway. But the final position for me came down to Marco Gabbiadini or Kevin Phillips. Now, Marco had electrifying pace. I don't think I've ever seen a quicker footballer. And a, and a blistering shot. And my daughter named her rabbit after him as well, back in the day. Funny enough, before, yeah. the, before the Czech trade final, when we were all in the pub, and Marco Gabbiadini was there, and so was my daughter. So I took her up and introduced her, and she was she couldn't speak. 
even after all these years, she still couldn't. She, he was her absolute hero as a footballer, and she couldn't speak. She was. <laughs> 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 but, but, but I'm not going to go for Marco. I'm going to go for the brilliant finishing of Ken Phillips to play alongside Cluffy. It would be, it, it would be interesting. There would be a, a fight to see who who got the through balls because Cluffy would be going for everything. And um, but the two of them would score a hat full of goals. I think if we'd if we'd ever had a really really good big centre forward, big bruiser, and um, I possibly would have put him alongside Cluffy. But apart from Quinny, I can't remember any big song um, centre forwards. We, we've had so so relatively short um center four was in cluffy and super cares yeah no the, yeah that's that's fantastic i think <clears throat> obviously kevin phillips scored so many goals i always like to ask people though do you have a, a, a goal from that kevin phillips scored that stands out in particular because he did score so many great goals but do you think you could narrow it down to one that's that's your favorite if you'd, asked, if you'd asked me to prepare that beforehand, I would have been able to. But I can remember a goal he scored. It was away from home. Might have been somebody like Oldham. I, I can't remember. But, but it was away from home. And he took the ball down the left channel and just moved inside, got it onto his right foot. And he hit the shot from about 25 yards. And he just curled it in to the opposite top corner and I could not believe that he'd done that. He hit it with such power. I should really go for some of the goals he scored against Newcastle. The one that he did in the when he dug it out of the puddles and hacked it across to the far side of the goal, which was a it, it wasn't a great goal except apart from the fact it was against Newcastle. And um I'm gonna get killed for this because one of my pals in Newcastle support and he's probably gonna watch this. But um, that no, that goal away from home where, where he curled the ball. I'm, I'm sure somebody, Andy Goldsworthy, would say, "Oh, I remember that. That was against so and so on." Yeah. The, 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 the I do know. What, I do know what goal you're talking about. I do know what goal you. I have seen it before. Yeah. I just can't remember. Can't remember who, who it's against. I'll find that out though. Brilliant. Yeah, it, it, it was. It was. A, it was a brilliant goal. And some of the goals that he scored. I mean, it was just. Like the, the technique that that you use, even for that for that goal, I don't know what part of his foot he used. He used to do that. It's just really, it's crazy. No, it was a it was a yes. It was a, it was a very very hard curler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, incredible. But yeah, that is your team going along the bottom there. It's a fantastic team. Um, I don't think anyone you know couldn't agree with that. Um. But yeah, it's a very, it's a very strong team. You know, as we said before, the the goalkeeper and back four could probably play a five a side team, you know, of of their own. Um, but then you've also got you know the likes of you know as you spoke about Jim Baxter, and then obviously you know Brian Clough and and, and Kevin Phillips up front. But obviously with every team, you need a manager. So who who have you picked to take this team forward? Well, I had a look back through the managers, and from the date that we were founded in eighteen eighty nine. Until just about the time I started supporting them, 1957, we only had six managers in 77 years. In the 64 years since then, we've had 47 managers. <laughs> and, we, and we've had 11 since you've been supporting us. Yeah. We've had 11, 11 managers in the last 10 years. But there's only two managers for me. Um, and that is, it's between Bob Stoker because he led us to the 1973 Cup final and Alan Brown, who proved himself to be a brilliant manager um, tactically without really ever winning any, anything. But yeah. I, think, I think the testament to how fantastic a manager he was was how good a manager some of the players who played for him became. Um, I mean, Billy Bingham played for him in, in his early days and he became a manager of Everton and, and Northern Ireland. Don Revy managed that fantastic, I mean, even though we all hated them, but that fantastic Leeds team in the late 60s and early 70s. And he was um, thought of to be a tattoo genius. And of course, Brian Clough played under Alan Brown. And there's a great story about Alan Brown saying that um, Brian Clough, after all the players had gone to bed, Brian Clough would sneak back down and sit down with the manager and the coaches talking about tactics for the next day. And they'd have to say, Cloughy, get to bed. 
get a bit. No, I wanted. No, he was so interested in talking, and apparently Alan Brown was a wonderful tactician. So he's the guy I would choose to manage this fantastic bunch of Sunderland players. I think. Yeah. I didn't look through, but I think I might have had four out of the cup final team, and four or five who came through the youth system, even though they weren't local lads. So, um, and also most of them are from we're gone by and I don't know whether that's because of my age or because they were better then or because perhaps when it, when you're in your teens and your 20s you have a, a very deep love for the footballers you know they just seem like to be magical magical players magical people yeah def- definitely definitely and I, yeah of course I mean the, the, I think you know, you've, you've got a mix, a mix of people there. I think, you know, sort of Michael Gray, Kevin Phillips from the, you know, it's the same era. And then yet yeah, a lot of, um, a lot of older players as well. But I think all of them in their prime would be uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. And as you say as well, I think, um, you know, I think people, people my age a lot, you know, if we really like one player, then sort of whatever they do, whatever makes mistakes that they make, you know, you're, you're very, I don't know. You don't, you don't really want to want to criticize people. You can say the same about Luke Nine at the moment. We know that he's, you know, he probably won't be anything more than uh, he probably would never play in the Premier League. But he's still just a, a great character. I think it's hard to criticize people like that sometimes. No, it's it's very difficult because what what Sunderland fans like is somebody who puts a hundred percent effort in. What they hate is people who either don't or don't look like they're trying. And we've had a, we've had a few of those, and and some of the fans hate that. But you know, people like Bobby Kerr, who wasn't the greatest footballer who's ever lived, he gave a hundred percent all the time, and the fans loved him. And Luke only nine gives a hundred percent all the time. I mean, in the game, where are we now, Monday? The, in the last game, there was a guy about to shoot, and he just threw himself head first in front of the shot. You know, he could have easily given a penalty away, as it happens, but. That's just the sort of player he is, you know. He and he just did not want that guy to get a shot, you know, on target, because he's been listening to your dad about the call keeper. <laughs> he was worried if that hit went towards Lee Burge, you wouldn't say. Well, to yeah. be honest, though, he did. He did work Lee Burge in the first half, oh nine, didn't he? he did. When that ball came he across, did. he nearly put it in our own net. <laughs> But uh, anyway, but yeah, no, it's it's been um it's been fantastic going through um going through the, the team. Mickey, how have you how have you found it going through the team? It was a lot more. I've enjoyed going through it with you, Matthew. Um, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Um, because I knew I had some real favourites like Cuffy and Jim Baxter and Charlie Hurley and, and Jimmy, I guess. Um, so I thought, well, I've just got a few more players around there, but. As I started going through, this is about the fourth iteration, and each time it's changed. I think I probably only had once. The first time I did it, um, I think I only had one person from the cup final team, Dave Watson. Um, I, but now there's four because I kept thinking, no, no, he's he's worth a place. He's worth a place. But it's it's so hard to to miss people out. I mean, I I um I said to your dad, can I have a subs bench? And he said no. So I thought, well, I'm going to have one anyway. And obviously, in addition to Honeyman and Diamond, <laughs> I've, I've got Jordan Pickford, Terry Butcher, Kevin Ball, Gary Rowell and Marco Gabbiadini. Now, I mean, what's what's that like for a subs bench, eh? Yeah. So um, I, we, we've had yeah. some great players through the years. but um, Yeah, and we'll have more as well in, we in the next few years. We will. You know, someone might be, you know, I might do one of these shows, uh, however many years in the future, and we might be talking about some person we've never heard of saying, you know, they scored that incredible goal to get us back into the, back into the Premier League or, you know, into the Champions League places or something like that. Do you know what I mean? They, that could happen. That could happen in the next however many years. But um, yeah, no, time goes on, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it does. It's, I mean, unfortunately, we're in the middle of a long trough. Um, I mean, obviously, winning the cup was was fantastic, but it's it's the sort it's the Papa John's, isn't it? It's not the FA Cup, it's not the League Cup, but it's a cup, and it's the first time we won a Wembley in ten tries. So, yeah, that was good. Exactly, but it was about, it was about beating us. What you should do, you should go through all of the teams and give us a list of the, um, you know, if you if you go like right goalkeeper Jimmy Montgomery got so many votes. 
so many songs and got so many votes. And, and it'd be interesting to see um, how, because yeah. you, you, well, you know from arguments in the pub before our away games, how people's opinions differ. I mean, I don't think Lee Bird is anywhere near as bad as the as the complete lead family thing to. I, I think he's okay. I can't remember the last mistake he made. But that's that's the, the beauty of football, isn't it? Different people have different opinions and we vent those opinions before and often after the match as well. And that's what makes football such a brilliant game. But yeah. I'd, be, I'd be interested to know. I'm going to start watching um, the past ones now. Now I can't be influenced. And I bet you the first one I'll think, oh, no, how did I not put him in? <laughs> yeah well I, I mean yeah i mean but it's your it's your team though i think um you know the th thing i stress to people as well it's not it's not you know your best 11 it's not your, your worst 11 it's just your 11 it's it's who you like i mean i had someone who who put in max paranade and mcgee just because they met him and 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 had a had a lovely conversation you know they <laughs> they just they, they got on well with them so it's just about your yeah, your Sunderland eleven really. They yeah, asked what it says. It's called my Sunderland eleven. It's yeah, but that, that's that's what it's all about. So as long as you're happy with your team and you know those really, are your players, I'm, I'm really pleased with it. I'm really pleased with it. And as I've been going through, there's there's not once have I said, oh, I shouldn't have put him in. No, I'm pleased with that. I'll I'll wait for your dad's criticism, of course. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what my dad's team is as well because, uh, yeah, I, I would, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any idea. He hasn't, he hasn't praised um, too many people. I think he'd be struggling to find uh, eleven people. Who knows? Um, <laughs> well, who's going to interview you, Matthew? Well, uh, I, <laughs> I don't, I don't know that yet. I don't know that yet. Uh, if anyone wants me to do, uh, to say, to say my eleven, I'll do it. But uh, no one's asked me. No one's asked me as of yet. What? Why don't you do your dad and both of you do it at the same time? So he can pick his, you can pick yours. Yeah, yeah, I might. They might. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. To be honest, that's a good idea. To be honest, I'll see. I'll see. He'll, he'll watch this and he'll tell me what he'll tell me what he thinks. Um, but yeah, that might that might be an interesting one to do. Might be an interesting one to do. Um, but yeah, no. Thank thank you very much for 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 joining me, though, Mickey. It, uh, one last question, and I do ask I do ask this to everyone. The Sunderland fans watching right now, if you had a if you had a message to give them, what would you say? Oh, blimey. I would say just keep open your heart because we will get back to being a great, great team again. I I think I mean at my age, I'm just hoping that I can see us back as a successful Premier League side. I think it might be outside of my time. But I hope it's not. I think it might take us between five and ten years. But I think if this if this owner does what he says, if he's in for the long haul, and if we buy well and we have good managers, you know the fans are there. And if if you can't play for those fans, you can't play for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we'll just we'll just hope that we have a we have a bright future, um, yeah, with our new owner, and uh, we'll be we'll be back soon, and um, hopefully we'll be back in the pubs. Um, I don't know when August August. Hopefully that's when we'll we'll all be back. I think the fixtures come out middle of June, don't they? So we've got two months before we can sit down and start planning. I mean, I'll, I'll have forgotten all the pubs we're meeting. I'll have to um, go back to yeah. When the hell do we meet for doing it? <laughs> oh, no, no, we won't be playing them next year, will we? No, we won't. We'll be planning yeah. our pub. The pub will be going to uh, in Newcastle. That's where we will. <laughs> That's so, where we. If, if we if we don't get up this season, it will be so so heartbreaking. Yeah, it really will. It really will. But I'm 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 sure we will. I I genuinely am. I'm sure we will. And um and hopefully when we're back, it's championship season. The first first game of the season back in August, Red Hot Summer's Day in the championship. We've got a lovely new yeah. sixty million pound squad. Um and yeah, there are hopefully everything goes goes really really well. But yeah, I just well, I've, I've renewed my season card, even though I don't know what division we're going to be playing in. So there's positivity <laughs> for you. Yeah, there you, there you go. There you go. It's support. It's support. That's that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, 
but yeah, no, I just want to thank everyone for, for watching. Um, yeah, you know, as always, our own association with the Son of Food Bank and the Fans Museum. So go and uh, check those out. The links to them will be in the description below. But yeah, thank you everyone for watching. From myself and Mickey, we wish you all the best. Stay safe and away the lads.